Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. We're going to look at the Gospel of John and how the inspired author of that gospel uses a very profound passage in the book of Sirach. Now, on this channel, we've already done several videos where Jesus uses Sirach in a very important way. And so we're going to focus on John's uh, use of Sirach. You're going to see how both of them very much correspond to one another, and actually how Sirach lends some depth to uh, our understanding of what John has to say about Jesus. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, because here is the Apocrypha Apocalypse. Right, so let's look at the passage in question. Now, for those who defend the divinity of Christ, this particular verse is probably already very familiar to you. It is John chapter 1, verse 18. And the reason why it should be familiar to you, because it is one of a few passages in the New Testament that actually talks about Jesus being God explicitly. And the verse reads, quote, no one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, the Deuterocronical text that John is kind of riffing off of or using in this particular verse comes from the Deuterocanonical book of Sirach, and that is Sirach 43.33. Now, I have to point this out because there are different versifications of Sirach. So in some of your Bibles, the verse in question will be verse 33. In other Bibles, it'll be in verse 31. It all depends whether the versification follows the Septuagint or uh, the typical English translation. So if you're reading the book of Sirach along with us and the verses don't seem to match, that's why. So you just need to adjust your reading. And the verse in question in Sirach is, who has ever seen him? and this is talking about God, and can describe him, or who can extol him as he is. When you view both passages, you'll see that the, there is the first connection that jumps off the page, namely this idea or the rhetorical question of who has seen God and can describe him. Right, because this is the very first portion of verse 18 in John. No one has ever seen God at any time. Now, although this is a point of contact, it's not a very good point of contact because there are numerous passages throughout the Old Testament uh, proto-canon and also in the New Testament that also speaks to the fact that no one's ever seen God as God. And so... This but in and of itself is not sufficient to show any kind of dependency or connection with Sirach any more than any other text, okay? So if this was the only piece of the puzzle we possessed, it would definitely not be definitive, and we wouldn't be able to speak of any kind of dependency. But there are several pieces that also go along with this. First, as you notice, Sirach's first rhetorical question is a compound question. Not only has he asked the question, who has seen him, but also who can describe him? Now, this points to uh, a thematic parallel between John 118 and Sirach 43, 33 or 31. Namely, the combination of both no one seeing God and no one being able to describe God being paired with John, where no one has seen God except the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, and he has explained them. So both uh, elements of that single compound rhetorical question is presented in John and Jesus given as the solution or the answer to those rhetorical questions. A third element that we can also note is that both John 1.18 and Sirach, uh, both use the same Greek word. Now, here are the words, and I need to explain this because it's the same Greek word, but as you can see in the English transliteration, 
they're not identical. They are different forms, or rather they're cognates of the same word. In John, he uses the Greek word exegesomai, which is the Greek word from which we get the English word exegesis. In other words, explaining or uh, bringing out fully the meaning of something. The word used in Syriac is a cognate. In fact, they're both cognates. So it's the same word, just a slightly different form that has the same meaning. This is not my opinion. This is what I found in standard Greek lexicons uh, written by Protestants. So let me give you two examples just to show that I'm not lying. These are cognate words. Okay. So the first text we're going to look at is the Lexum analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament. And as you see here, the word in question is the form that we find in Syriac. And it says cognate words, and it gives all sorts of cognate words. As you can see, there is the word right there that's highlighted. It's exegizomai, the same Greek word used in John 1.18. So these two are cognates. Um, I'll give you a second resource as well, just to show that these are identical meanings. This comes from Loanita's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament based on semantic domains. And basically what this does is it's a lexicon that pairs together Greek words that have essentially the same meaning. And as you can see here under the entry for exegeomai, you see the third word right there that is the same cognate form that's found in Syriac. And the definition for this is to provide detailed information in a systematic manner, to inform, to relate, to tell fully, and notice here, it also gives John 1.18 as an example. So we have a lexical connection in the Greek where cognates of the same word are used both in John 1.18 and also Syriac 43.33 or 31, depending on your translation, both um, all of these things, the different elements of the compound question being present, um, the lexical connection as well, and also, by the way, the surrounding context also fit very nicely together. And that's yet another element that shows that there seems to be a dependency between John and Sirach. So let's take a couple of seconds. Let's briefly look at the surrounding context for both passages, beginning in the book of Sirach. Uh, I'm going to be using the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition for Sirach. And this is Sirach. 43 verses 28 through 33, according to the versification of the RSVCE. Okay, just so you know, if you're reading it in a different translation, the verse numbers will probably be off a couple of uh, verses. It says, quote, where shall we find strength to praise him? For he is greater than all his works. Terrible is the Lord and very great and marvelous is his power. When you praise the Lord, exalt him as much as you can, for he will surpass even that. When you exalt him, put forth all your strength and do not grow weary, for you cannot praise him enough. And then here is verse 31 or 33, as I mentioned. Who has seen him and can describe him? Who can extol him as he is? Then the next verse many things greater than these lie hidden. For we have seen but a few of his works. For the Lord has made all things, and to the godly he has granted wisdom. End quote. A couple of things to note. First, the emphasis in Sirach that God has made all things. We haven't seen all that he's created, and we haven't seen God. So therefore, we aren't capable of describing him, of extolling him as he is. We fall short. Now, remember, this is the old covenant. This is before the incarnation. And that's exactly the situation which uh, pious Jews were in, is that without being able to see God by witnessing only some of what God has done in the creation, and everything is done by God in creation, uh, we can't fully 
understand him. We can't fully describe him. We can't fully extol him as he is. We all fall short. Okay, so let's go to the context in John. We'll start in verse 14 and go to 18. Of course, this is before the, the great prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be through the Word, and nothing came to be that is. So basically, the Word creates all things, okay, which is more or less assumed in Sirach that God has created all things. Okay, going to verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's stop there really quick, because this will be important later on. Uh, as you know, might know, the Greek word there translated dwelt is literally tabernacled, or he pitched his tent. So the word becomes flesh and is tabernacled among us. Like I said, that'll become important later on. And we saw his glory the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So again, we have this idea, we've seen his glory. Moving on, verse 15, he talks about how John testifies that the one coming after him ranks higher than him because he existed before him. Verse 16, for of his fullness we have received and grace upon grace. 17, for the law was given to Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. That's a very important point, too, is this is something John will repair to a few times in his gospel, is that God reveals his wisdom through Moses, so that through the Torah, we have a kind of um, mediated access to God's grace and truth. And Jesus is the fulfillment, the realization of that. He is the living Torah. He is the wisdom of God. So he's superior to that which was revealed to Moses. Verse 18, of course, is the passage in question. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained them. Now, a Protestant theologian, Theodore Zahn, summarizes both contexts and how they perfectly fit together. And it's worth quoting here. Now, this is my English translation of the German uh, that Zahn puts out. I also will provide you the German text underneath. So if you want to double check my translation, if, I, if there are some inaccuracies, it isn't quite correct, mail culpa. I think this gives the gist. And I think he, he is able to encapsulate how well these two contexts fit together, almost like a hand in glove. So here's what Zahn has to say about the two contexts. Only one could do that, who was God, and while dwelling with God, saw God. And if he had not been begotten of God as a man of flesh and come into the world, God would have remained as unknown to men as he was before. Sirach's question would remain unanswered. Who has seen him and will tell? Who will praise him as he is? Only one who was both at the same time monogenes and theos, could give an account of God on the basis of his own direct perception of God. Now, as we'll soon see, Protestant lexicographers and also commentators will note how it seems as if John 118 is directly answering the questions put forth in Sirach. But for now, let's focus more on whether there's a recognizable dependency between these two texts. Like I said, you have all these different elements that line up together no one's ever seen God. The uh, composite question of seen and described is found in John. Lexicographical um, connection between John and Sirach as well. And you have this wonderful confluence of context in which the questions that are raised and the limitations that are recognized in Sirach is overcome by the context of John. So uh, you have all that together. But even if we just limited the information down to just a few elements, not all of those elements, but just a couple, several Protestant commentators believe that that's sufficient enough to show there's a dependency of John on Sirach and that he's using Sirach in his formulation of John 118. For example, the Ellicott uh, commentary for English readers summarizes it as follows. The verse is connected by a likeness of Greek words, too striking, to be accidental, with the question of Jesus the son of Sirach asked some three centuries before, 
who had seen him that he might tell us. Sir, 43 colon 31. So Ellicott sees this as uh, that the Greek is just too striking to be merely coincidental, that he sees that there definitely is some sort of interdependence between the two, namely that John seems to be answering the very questions raised by Sirach. Uh, this is not only Ellicott alone, but also Henry Alford as well. In Alford's Greek Testament, the exegetical and critical commentary, which speaks of John actually adopting the phraseology of Sirach 43, 33, or 31, in which uh, Alfred says, The evangelist speaks in this verse in accordance with the sayings of the Gnosis, whose phraseology he has adopted, tis Herican Orton, Chi, Ectixitai, Sirach 43, colon 31. So again, we see um, here Alfred looking at the Greek text, recognizing that John seems to be adopting the phraseology that's expressed in Sirach 43. So again, a strong indicator by Protestant exegete, who certainly has no uh, reason to confirm Catholicism, saying that you have the same kind of phraseology present in John 118 as you find in Sirach. No less of authority than the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, uh, commonly known simply by the last name of the edit main editor who was Gerhard Kittel, it's known as Kittel, uh, 10 volume work. In Kittel, you have under the word exegeomai, uh, Friedrich Bushnell notes, There is a clear affinity between John 118 and Syrac. 4331, 33. Tis here auton, God, Chi ek diegesetai. John 1.18 is like an intentional answer to this question. So again, echoing these other scholars, he recognizes that there is a, quote, clear affinity between John 1.18 and Sirach. And so this clear affinity obviously is unmistakable. Okay. Not only that, but he actually says that he believed that John seems to be almost intentionally answering the questions posed by Sirach. And we saw that with Zahn, and we see the, the same implication also recognized by other Greek scholars as well. Moving on to yet another standard Greek lexicon, we go to Seslas and Ernst, the theological lexicon of the New Testament. And while it's not quite as emphatic as Kittle, nevertheless, it does recognize that Sirach was the background to John's statement about the Son. And it reads as follows. There is therefore no reason to substitute another meaning in John 1.18. An only Son, God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has told about him. This is the culmination of the prologue. The gospel can be opened, it is the exus, the laying open, the narration of the word of God by Christ for the world. The evangelist is probably thinking of Sirach 4331, who then has seen the Lord and can tell about him, Ectixitai. So these authors say that it is quite likely, it's probable, that John is actually thinking about Sirach 4331 or 33. Um, Another standard work is Barnard's A Critical and Exegetical Commentary on the Gospel According to St. John, and he too echoes Kiddo's statements regarding the evangelist answering Sirach's question when he says, That God is invisible to the bodily eye was a fundamental principle of Judaism, Exodus 33, 20, Deuteronomy 4, 12. The son of Sirach asks, Tis he rake and autun kai ectixitai, Sirach 43, 31, to which John supplies the answer here, compare Exxato at the end of the verse. So all of these scholars recognize that the gospel is answering the questions that were posed by Sirach. But that's only the first question, right? The first question is a compound question. No one has ever seen God or described him. And then the answer is, John says that the only begotten God who is at the bosom of the Father, he has seen God, which is implicit in the text, and he can explain him. 
Again, all those connections between the two. So you have this back and forth between Sirach and the Gospel of John. But there's a third element that we haven't talked about, because the second question posed by Sirach is the question of, or who can extol him as he is? Now, we don't find this in John 1.18, and that might be troubling that John would only focus on the first question. But lo and behold, John actually answers that third question as well, not in the Gospel of John, but in his other work in the first epistle of John. And indeed, let's read it in context. We will go to 1 John 3, verse 1, and we'll read down to the end of 2. It says, quote, see what love the Father has bestowed on us that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And it's this very last line, the end of the very last line that you see uh, a definite connection between 1 John 3, 2 and Sirach. To explain this, let's look at yet another Protestant source. This is from um, William H. Dubney's work, The Use of the Apocrypha in the Christian Church. And commenting on this passage, he says, One more instance from the New Testament of apocryphal knowledge in its writers. St. John in his first epistle, 3-2, uses the well-remembered words we shall see him as he is. In Sirach 43-31, we read, Who hath seen him that he might tell us? And who can magnify him as he is? Here the sentence is indeed broken, and the idea of magnifying inserted, which St. John omits, but the same verb for seeing is used in a different tense, and both verses conclude alike, word for word, with auton kathosestin, as applied to God. Now, someone may push back on this and say, this is not dependent on Sirach, because there are many passages in the Old Testament that talk about how the just, when they enter into glory, that they'll be able to see God. So why single out Sirach as opposed to these other texts? In fact, let me give you a couple examples of these texts that speak of the just seeing God. For example, in Psalm 11:7, the Lord is just and loves just deeds. The upright shall see his face. In Psalm 17, 15, I am just. Let me see your face when I awake. Let me be filled with your presence. Also Psalm 42, 3, when can I go and see the face of God? So clearly in the proto-canon, there's lots of indications that the just will be able to look upon the face of God. So why suggest, like Dubney does, that Sirach is being mentioned here? John answers Sirach's second question, who will magnify him or exalt him as he is? He answers that the saints in glory will be like Christ, and they will see Christ as he is. Okay, the same answer to that last question posed by Sirach. In John 1.18, John answers Sirach's twofold question about seeing God and explaining God. Of course, the only begotten God who has seen and described the Father uh, since he's from the bosom of the Father. In 1 John 3.2, we being children of God are being transformed into glory to be like Christ because we shall see him as as he is. So we are going to look upon Christ as he truly is, and we will uh, be like him. And the connection here, and you'll notice how different it is from those quotes from the Psalms, is not only do these elements fit together, but 1 John 3, 2 uses the exact same words as Sirach, as he is. Aton, kathos, esteem. Okay, so you see those same three Greek words are present in both passages as well. So you also have a very strong lexical connection as well. 
So in summary, you have two complex questions being raised by Sirach. These are explicitly answered by John. The points raised match the lexical connections of exegesomai and autan kathos esteen are present in both passages. The context fits perfectly. They're all from the same author. Uh, these are, you know, it's Johannine, both the instances, and they all connect to the same deuterocanonical text. In fact, the same deuterocanonical verse. Moreover, the context fits together, and John's response actually makes it even more profound. And so I think this is a good time for us to step back and look at a pattern that's developed in Jesus and John's use of Sirach, because I think they're using Sirach in a particular way. And there's enough evidence here that we can um, draw out some general conclusions. Now, I'm going to have to harken back to several videos that we've done in regards to the use of Sirach in the New Testament. For example, in previous videos, we looked at John's prologue and uh, the first couple of verses before 118, of course, 114, the word becomes flesh and was tabernacled among us. This has links to Sirach in Sirach 24.3. We find out that God's wisdom leaps from the creator's mouth as a word. And also we find in verse 8 that uh, that word is commanded by the Father to be tabernacled in Israel. So uh, you see those links there in John 1.14. We also produced another video where Jesus uses Sirach in John 6, verse 35, where, jo where Jesus says to him, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And we showed how he's using Sirach 2420 to explain some, a deeper meaning about who he is in his relationship to the Father, because Sirach 2420 says, he who eats of me will hunger still. He who drinks of me will thirst for more. I personally think that uh, Sirach, like Proverbs, speaks about God's wisdom and particularly focused on wisdom's role in creation. Sirach actually goes even one step further than Proverbs, and he speaks further about God's wisdom dwelling in Israel. And this could be dwelling in the temple, actually being a minister in the temple, interesting enough, because that harkens to Hebrews talking about Jesus being the high priest in the heavenly temple, and specifically that God's wisdom is embedded in the Torah. Okay, so the Torah is, is how God is dwelling, you know, his wisdom is dwelling within his people. And as we noted in our video on John 6, 35, Jesus takes Sirach's comments about the Torah, he applies it to himself, and applies it in such a way to give a whole different level to that insight that's found in Sirach. And I think this kind of riffs a little bit off of what we found in John when we're going through the context about the law was given to Moses, and grace and truth are realized in Christ. So, Sirach is talking about the Torah, the written law, God's wisdom in writing. You'll always be hungry and thirsting for more wisdom because it is a kind of mediated uh, font of truth and grace. But with Jesus, he says that if you come to him, you'll never hunger and never thirst, which implies that he is the very wisdom of God itself. Or maybe you could even say he's the living Torah. Again, that fits perfectly with John and his uh, understanding of the superiority of Jesus to Moses and the law. Again, fits perfectly with what elements that we find in Sirach. So he's using Sirach in order to show the superiority of Christ over, in that case, the, the Torah. In John 1.18, John does something similar. Sirach recognizes how little the Jews could know about the Most High, since he's beyond us. Uh, we we ha haven't seen him directly, so we can't describe him. We know him through his works, but we haven't seen all of his works. Some of his works lay hidden, and we haven't seen him. So it's impossible for us to magnify him or give him glory as he is. The incarnation, as Zahn puts it, does not allow for Sirach's 
question to remain unanswered. In other words, the incarnation provides the answer to Sirach, where Sirach asks the question, who has seen God and has described God? Uh, 118 in John says the only begotten God has seen the Father and has described the Father. So the incarnation answers this perennial question of the old covenant people. And it shows how Christ, the wisdom of God, breaches that gap so that we can have direct understanding, exegesis of the Father through Christ. The same thing is true in 1 John 3, 2. Only it's in regards to the just, that when we're glorified, we will be made like Christ, for we will see Christ as he is. And as we pointed out, the Greek there is identical, as he is. So given these points, we ask, was Sirach just some pious extra biblical literature? Uh, was that how Jesus and John used it? I, I tend to think not. In fact, it seems like not only is there a dependency here, but in several places in the Gospel of John and on the lips of Jesus that speak about and affirm the truth of Sirach and uses that truth to explain further the true nature of Christ's divinity. We see this over and over again. Like I said, the wisdom of God being the word in Sirach 24.3, the wisdom of God being tabernacled in when uh, God becomes flesh in Sirach 24.8. We see that uh, Jesus is in John 6, greater than the Torah, and uh, the Torah is uh, mentioned in Sirach 24.20, and also John 1.18. At the climax of the prologue, uh, it speaks about how Christ, the only begotten God, has seen the Father and described him. And again, that answers those major questions that were open in Sirach 43. Now, if you're non-Catholic, I want you to ask yourself this question. If Sirach were a proto-canonical book, and you saw these connections in the New Testament, honestly, would you not readily admit that John is using and Jesus is using this book as inspired scripture. In other words, if this was part of the canon, I don't think there would be a doubt. I think every Protestant exegete, every Protestant commentator, and uh, others would readily say Jesus is using and mining Sirach in order to provide information about the true nature of him as the divine son. But since uh, these books and Sirach is not considered inspired, it has been kind of pushed to the wayside. So you still have commentators who will note there's an affinity that apes the phraseology. And uh, even some will say that John answers the questions posed by Sirach. But they, don't, they fail to see the importance of the implications of this connection and Jesus and John's use of Sirach in these texts in some very important theological points concerning his divinity. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please like it. Tell your friends about it. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. We appreciate it. Also, William Albrecht and myself are on Patreon. We truly appreciate your support because your financial support enables us to obtain uh, hard to get information that's often quite expensive and it helps defray the cost for us so it's truly appreciate your patronage and until next time i'm gary machuda i'll see you later i hope you have a great week bye bye